it's kind of late. Yes, this is the latest webinar we've I've ever done. <laughs> okay, I've done them earlier. I've done them nine o'clock in the morning, but I haven't ever done them at ten o'clock my time at night. I know. I'm like, so it's been like I said. I'm like playing catch up. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, slow down is not in your vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> not on purpose. <laughs> But I, you know, I've been off the road a year now. I've not been on an airplane. I came back from South Carolina. I think, what is this? The 16th, I think like net today or tomorrow I got back from, and that was it. Hi, Deb, winner of our grand prize, who was supposed to- <laughs> Deb won, to Deb won and had to win. I'm gonna win. embarrass her now, totally. <laughs> Congratulations, Deb. She, she actually signed up for the webinar, but she didn't tune in for a for a very really rare occasion because Deb comes to so many of these. So um, let's see. we've got a lot of regulars, and they're all here to right now. <laughs> okay, they're staying up late. Well, it's not as late for us as it is you. Uh, yes, it's not as late as you go west, like Alberta. It's not so bad. Chicago, it's an hour earlier. Uh, uh, but Annalise, she's down in South Carolina, so she, it's it's, it's late there too. <laughs> But um, all right. And is anybody getting snow? Like we're we we are so cold tonight. We were beautiful on the weekend. It's uh, thirty nine degrees here, and it's going to start raining. We had we're going to have yesterday. snow on Friday. It says. Mm. <laughs> wrong, wrong, wrong. We had ice yesterday. It's like it's, it's trash in our trees. Oh, Australia! Awesome. Yeah, I figured we'd pick up some folks from down under. All right, we'll give you all another 30 seconds and then we'll get this ball rolling. Uh, you had two inches in Illinois yesterday. Oh, if anybody's seen photos from Colorado, they said it's like the biggest blizzard since 79. My friend who was in Wyoming in 79 oh. for a blizzard, um, they they got hammered. They have like six foot snow drifts and- Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah, no, no, I don't live there. That's why I don't live there. <laughs> Okay. It looks, it looks pretty in the pictures. <laughs> yep. All right. Let me do an intro and then we'll get going. And of course, if you have any questions, you pop them in the Q&A or the chat and we'll ask Ida when it fits into the conversation. All right. Ready? Yep. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of, pan of webinars during the pandemic and we're coming up on one year. Um, I'll have to do something special for that one. Um, I think I started the end. I'm trying. I have to go look. The end of March. Uh, I'll go figure it out. Anyway, tonight my guest is Ida Hammer, one of my favorites, and she's here to talk about hoof abscesses. So welcome, Ida. Hey guys, how are you? Yep. Um, so Ida, I'm sorry, in, so case, in case uh, some people don't know who you are, just give them a kind of a just a brief ticky tour of your life experience <laughs> so i'm a hundred percent student of the horse and a qualified hoof geek <laughs> but um i trim horses um and we work on the whole horse approach to trimming and i teach classes throughout the u.s to teach uh horse owners and professionals to do the same so i'm like i love the surefoot pads love everything wendy has been doing since in the last year and i'm really grateful that you guys are all peeking in at us yeah and um Ida, you've been doing this for how long now trimming yeah uh going on 16 years wow okay what'd you uh, do professionally i should say pardon me what'd you do before trimming so you know i'm like i've always done things with horses but my real job at the time like before i was a trimmer was i, I worked in a car factory built cars you did <laughs> i was bored out. yeah i was bored out of my mind what kind of but, cars mitsubishis oh okay brad used to be up in detroit area and going to the car factories all the time yeah, I'm like, it was, I'm like, it was a good job. It supported my habits because I, at the time, I'm like, I still taught horsemanship lessons and, and I'm like, and I've like hit and miss trimming on feet and stuff like that, our own horses, but I didn't have any professional training until 16 years ago. And then, um, then it's just like, just, you've certainly uh, taken off with it. Let's, <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm like, I've become obsessed. I'm like, I, I smile at my students. Use that word, but I'm glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed and I embrace it. I'm like, I, I tease my students when they say, just gonna learn how to trim my own horses and I'll tell them for now. <laughs> no, I'm sticking with the three I do. That's it. <laughs> All right. Okay. So tonight we're gonna talk about hoof abscesses. Tis the season. Yes. <laughs> it's, 
it is uh, very much a season of hoof abscesses. So um, I'm gonna like like get my PowerPoint up so I can get some stuff and share the screen. So give me just a awesome. second to do that. Yeah, you set up to share the screen. So um, I, just while I was doing that, if you have dealt with hoof abscesses, just pop that in the chat. How many of you that are on tonight have dealt with hoof abscesses. I um with Al, I think it was 2018, he had two on the left, front and then rear, and then 2019, he did it on the other side, front and then rear. And so uh, having not a lot to do with hoof abscesses, I had a bunch. <laughs> yes, I'm like, it seems like they'll, they'll come and go like, um, like you can get a whole series of them and that has to do with the tracks. So um, let me, get here from see i'm like i'm so talented i can't do two things at once so. so there are people dealing with it right now that are on this webinar let's see i'm trying to see i can't see my whoops and uh, of course here in virginia we were pretty wet and then we just turned dry there's no surface moisture the ground is dry dry we've had really dry air so now we're looking at fire danger as opposed to wet conditions yeah but sometimes that's a part of it with that so that that's where like you know every every part of the continents are different but like for us in the midwest right now is um friday like my, my dog's starting to bark out the door here sorry um but for us right now in the midwest it's like we've just we've had all the snow then we thawed so now we're going to go through mud and then it softens the hooves and then it will turn off dry or frozen and it causes bruising so like that 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 becomes an issue okay well you're going to take us through all of this right yeah i'm going to go through a bunch of it i'm going to try to i think i'm going to bring that down to it's not so big so i can so i can just talk about it so i don't know if you can so yeah, I don't, I guess. you know what you can do is if you if you run the slideshow but then you um minimize it on your screen we can still see it big okay. right so if you just so, uh so you can still see that okay we can see that fine yep Okay. okay so so like there's a lot of different types of abscesses like they're all kind of abscesses and the first thing i want to say though like before i start this because you know you know how that is i'm i'm not a veterinarian so like i always say like talk about talk with your vet but i'm just talking about the abscesses from my experience and what we've seen and what we do so again i'm not trying to replace any veterinary advice and i always say you know consult with your vet for before anything that you do crazy <laughs> so but um, coronary abscesses. So like, so this is an example of this one. And so like, they'll break out the coronary band, and those those kind of abscesses, like they can be they can be kind of trivial, but they can be really huge too. This is not a bad sized abscess, but some horses will abscess on half of their foot, and that becomes a problem um, with those guys because when when it, like when you look at this one, so this this abscess like this, so at the point where that's at as it grows down that's that's a disconnected portion of the foot and so usually i'm like when you when you get a breakout at the top like that i'm like so on the bottom coming out the bottom there's gonna be a track that that's gonna associate it with uh the abscess there so i'm like usually you have this whole issue here that's a track and then that's part of the reason why like you said with um al like you had multiple abscesses where they like in the same area all the time i'm like if they were on one foot uh, well, no, they, they, he had an abscess, one on each foot, two, two in one year and two in another year. So they were all different feet. Okay. Um, so if you get abscesses like this one, I'm like, and you can get them in all different kinds of feet. And there's other things that can, I'm, like, I'm going to get to all the contributing factors, but like abscesses like this one, if you don't, if you don't get and keep that track clean as that's growing out, it's not uncommon for those horses to re-abscess again because I'm like the, the coronary band closes up and like it usually has a track that, that equals it on the bottom. So if you see that come out the top, I'm like usually on the bottom of that foot, I'll pick it up. I don't have the solar view of this one, but you, I, you'll pick it up and you'll see like a dark line on the white line. I'm like, so often, you know, oftentimes those are they're connected. And so um, at the end, I'll, like, I'll tell you about the, some of the products, but on, on cases like this for me. Can I just back um, up a little bit, Ida, and just have you talk about what's the definition of an abscess that would result in this? Okay, so so there's a lot of causes. I'm like, I've got that further down in this. Okay, fine, got it. Um, but an abscess so, is basically an inspection, right? Yes, I'm gonna back out of the slideshow for a second. I'll go to that So I should have started with that slide. Sometimes okay. my mind goes in five directions, so. <laughs> so we're going to go with um we're going to go with this slide so can you see these 
like there's different things we're going to talk about but so coronary abscess is like the first one that i had like that can that can happen from a like a puncture or something sharp in the the um in the bottom of the foot like all it needs to be is a little tiny uh poke or a piece of glass or anything that makes a uh, a little tiny hole where bacteria can get in in the um in the white line part of the foot and like and so those kind of abscesses will climb up and oftentimes come out the coronary band because the the lamina you know were they're all linear so like it can climb right up the uh track of that um also and i don't have it on here but when when i was learning how to trim and i've seen this continuously after um after my learning stages of it i've seen it uh pretty like fairly consistent throughout my career is um horses that have had iron shoes on for for long periods of time that that, that got very few breaks from them I'm like especially horses that have started early and then on to late and then when you take the shoes off I'm like nowadays for me I'm like if I if I have a horse that I'm doing and uh has been shod continuously in metal shoes for a long time I won't take the shoes off of that unless they let me put a glue on shoe or something on it because um, those lamina have been unified the whole time that they're held together by that that metal shoe. So when the horse like turns to the right or turns to the left, like however it's going, I'm like it doesn't it doesn't use just one part of its lamina at that time. I'm like the the whole shoe like uses all of it. So I'm like they never have a chance for the the as much bending and shaping and and moving of the lamina as they do when they're barefoot. And so they're not ever used to that. I'm like one of the I'm like he's actually a certified journeyman fairy that I worked with back in the day. And um and he he would show me like because he did a lot he did shoes too but he'd show me like horses at back to back if you just took them out and he said the the lamina can't handle that stress and so you know throughout my career before like before blue on options and stuff I'm like it wasn't uncommon to see a horse that you take out of shoes and like and, and look at he split they like they did blow a coronary abscess like within the first couple months and usually they weren't too bad. But um, it, it only started to make sense to me. And, and since that, um, I pull shoes and put something on them to, to protect them, to start upping their circulation a bit, but yet kind of stopping them from like having independent uh, laminar disconnection per se. It's not really disconnection, but um, um, uh, so bending and- so, so weakened lamina from, from wearing shoes for a long period of time can, can create an environment where there's a possibility for an abscess. If I got yes. that right? yeah like you said it much better i was like i was like like trying to say just like that but different your brain i i know where your brain is and so i'm just gonna it's like <laughs> in the parts that you're not saying well, thank you thank you very much <laughs> my brain needs help sometimes okay just think so fast <laughs> <laughs> um so with the like so gluing gluing a shoe on or something that that takes the pressure off of those and like uh gives the time for the circulation to build in the foot and start getting circulation and then they're still getting a little bit more stretching and movement because the the the, the rubber shoes are giving and so then it just gives them a head start so anything that i can do to not have them go through discomfort while they're transitioning is a win for me so that's one of the things that the coronary abscesses and the coronary bands like that other ones are again like the like if something sh sharp sticks in the foot that really really um you might not even see it because um it kind of like it's the the white line is a bit rubbery so I'm like if you stick uh, something sharp like even a piece of glass where it just goes in maybe an eighth of an inch it just actually puts the bacteria in far enough that it can take hold and and go on um also on the coronary uh abscesses I'm like I'm going to bring this picture up I'm going to switch pictures here but this one because um so can you can you, you know, make that of, one big like play the yep. side too so we can see it a little bigger so how's that so uh, this is, can, there yeah. we go great yep so this is courtesy of amelia de stefano sorry um but like, she had a really good picture of what happened here you can actually see it so um this horse i'm like like when she took this horse over i'm like this this was the foot this is the one day after the horse had been trimmed, like when she took it over. And um, so you'll see already here, there's an abscess that had happened at the coronary band mm -hmm. on this one. But when you have, when you let your hooves get that long or distorted, you, you create flare. And so that hoof wall hooks to the white line. If you've got this prying on it, like, so at the point, if you can just imagine the point of um, the most resistant would end up being right center of that toe with that, that part prying out. And so I'm like it makes it it creates a, a fissure so that bacteria can climb right up at that and come out the coronary band. 
So um, you need timely trims. I'm like, we, like we, we as trimmers kind of laugh at this is like it's lack of barrier disease because it's just left too long and in balance and it creates, uh, it creates where the uh, lamina can stretch or get torn and or separate and allow more bacteria in there. So then this is, this is after she took over and you can see the abscess growing down nicely. Yep. So uh, uh, I'm going to show my ignorance here because, you know, my thought about an abscess was there was like a little piece of gravel that got into that white line and that traveled up, but I hadn't thought about it as you poke a little hole and you get bacteria in there. I've always kind of had this uh, naive thought that like there's a little bit of grit or something that got up in there. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not naive at all. It's like, so back in the day before, um, before, like, like I said, I'm like, I, like I messed with trimming before I was professionally trained. So back in the day, before I went through the classes and started doing this as a career, I'm like, we were always taught that. In fact, I'm like, a lot of times, even to this day, people call those gravels. You know, yeah. so I'm like you're not the only one that thinks that, and and sometimes that is truly the case where they'll get something in there. But honestly, when when they get something in there that's that's actually a substance, I, as in a small piece of gravel or something, those can be pickly abscesses because they're really hard. I'm like it's it's hard for that to come out the top, and like to travel all the way up the top and and make it out. So if it's still in there, I'm like a lot of times that is exactly the cause of reoccurring abscesses in the same spot, oh. and um. So it's, it's always a track. I mean, so like wherever this is, I'm like, it, like, like without fail, if you see a coronary abscess, you'll see, see at directly underneath it, you'll see a blackened place in the white line. Like okay. I've not seen that not happen yet. Not, I, that's not to say that it won't sometime not happen, but so far they've always been connected. So, so basically if it comes out the top, whether you have a gravel or whether it's just bacteria and an infection, there's going to be a track all the way from the bottom of the foot that goes to where that came out at the coronet band. Yes. The only exception might be if the actual, um, the actual puncture or whatnot was in the coronary band that, that it didn't start at the bottom. Like right. if it starts in the bottom somehow though, and, and that's pretty common. Like if you think about it, the white line in the horse is rubbery and like, and they're walking around all different types of terrain. So if you think about it, it wouldn't take much with their weight, might just to like make a sharp, sharp poke. And, um, it, and you know how like in, they're in pastures, mud and manure, whatnot, like, so it'd be very easy to just get, get something in there and, and then it festers. Right. Okay, I'm gonna get back out of this one so I can, okay. So that's kind of the scoop on the coronary, the coronary abscesses. I'm like, there, there are, you know, I'm like, this is not all the, all the causes. And then I'm going to pop back down here to some more causes, and then I'll go back up to a different uh, slide. But okay. one of the things that I think that um, that is a huge eye opener to me, like for horses that are chronic abscessors, that they just abscess over and over and over, and and there's not really an indication of why. I'm like, you know, that they maybe they stepped on something the first time, but just every year. And then and then the the ones that are really the really prominent about it are the ones that abscess at the same time every year. Like whether it be when they're first starting on pasture and they're getting more sugars, or if um if it's like the like the cool seasons where we're just getting cold, where it's like cold cold season laminitis type of thing, those horses um a lot of times my Dr. Kellen has did a lot of research on the iron overload, so I'm just bringing that up a little bit because this is Dr. Kellen's at um area, but but you see a lot of it on the iron overloaded symptoms in horses. I'm like a lot of times it affects their hair. Um, it makes a big difference in their in abscessing too, because kind of sort of because it affects the lamin the lamina so much. Like as in a, they could have like a subclinical laminitis, and when they have that, it just it weakens the lamina even more. For it. so the, the the thicker the lamina is, the easier it is for debris and bacteria to climb in it. So then you have you have chronic abscessing on some of those horses. And for people who want to know more about the lamina, uh, Dr. Bowker's last, uh, the webinar we did, the last one they've done four, uh, really had great images of lamina and talked about a lot about it. So that's just a great resource for people. Yeah, I'm like, he's awesome. I'm like, so the, like the lamina is really like, it's the gatekeeper of all things hoof, really. So the tighter your, the tighter your lamina, the, the tighter that your lamina is, the better um, protection it has against anything that happens like that. Like this is like this is about abscesses, but it's like a sort of the same thing with white line disease. It's like 
Um, white Lyme disease is just a big bunch of fungus and bacteria, and it really can't get in unless the, the lamina is failing just a little bit. And like all it takes is a little fissure, and you know, like um, bacteria and, and all that stuff is opportunistic. I'm like they just hop in whenever they can. Yeah, because they're everywhere all the time anyway. Yes, yes. So um, that kind of that's some, that's a summary of what goes on with the the coronary band. Um, there might be some other ones. So the next one I'm going to bring up is. Um, I'm gonna bring up the subsolar abscesses because those are those are wicked. So like the coronary band abscesses, you know, you they can they grow down. Me? Yep. Okay, great. The, otherwise, I have to climb into my computer. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. So this is an example. This horse had been shod, and um, so um, this wasn't my client in the in the beginning, but um, what I think happened with this horse is it had been shod, and then it it, it she was getting kind of metabolic and um like a bit crusty and and i didn't know the horse or was, wasn't working on its feet but um then she got white line disease and then they um they did a partial resection of the white line but she was still in the shoes so like she wasn't really getting as much circulation and then um uh i was this horse was on the list i'm like it's still on the list to get form hoofed but um but i had to wait because she had a subsolar abscess so when you have a subsolar abscess and to me these are probably the most painful and the like can be some of the worst so you'll see right here this is this is an entrance hole of some you know this is a point of entrance or a point of escape depending on which happened first but the infection gets in here and then it gets underneath the whole layer I'm like because the 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 new soul grows out of the bottom of the coffin bone so then the soul that's present is interrupted from the the coffin bone by a, a layer of infection and it's subsolar because it can get all the way around here and i should have i have a fresh picture but i forgot to put it on here i'll try to find it in a bit but um uh it gets underneath the whole thing so you have infection lying all under this so this part is disconnected from what's growing in so this is the first thing, like we got the shoes off and you can actually see where they had resected her right here. Yeah. And then uh, there was like that day that she had shoes and pads on, like before I took the picture, I took those off and then I, the, there was so much infection. When I took the pad off and like the, the pus was coming out of here. Mm -hmm. And so then you can see how this bar is folded over. So that's, that's making more of a, a covering for more like infection to brew. And then um, this was, uh, this was like three weeks after. So we got this kind of like tamed down but this all of this is um she's gonna like get rid of all of that and what i'm doing right now is keeping her rolled and protected so that that doesn't come off before the new growth coming in is going to be um so strong. this picture on the right i'm trying to make sense out of it is she basically gonna slough the back part of her hoof capsule yeah i'm like she'll slough like eventually all of this will be gone so like this part's disconnected here this part's disconnected here. Um, it's disconnected on the bottom. So, like, if you if you would tap on this, it sounds hollow because it's not it's not held on. Like, it's holding on by the remnants that's around the front, the dorsal wall. Yeah. All of this is disconnected. So, um, that's these are serious abscesses. I'm like, and I'm like, and they're very lengthy, and you have to be careful. Like, I was really looking forward to getting her in in, in a formal hoof mold, but like, you can't lock this stuff in. You have to you have to wait and get this stuff healed up because that you don't need to put infection in a, a covered pot. Right. But, but um, that, that solar abscess was so bad that it went up the back of the foot. Yes, yes, because it, it, it covered, it was all underneath here. Like when I took the pads off the, oh my, there was probably a good, oh, I'm gonna say at least two thimblefuls of pus that came out of here. And then it still, you could push on all this stuff and it was all soft. And then um, all of this is disconnecting. And then um, I should have put the after pictures because I've got more current pictures. Um, we'll have to do that in another webinar. Yeah. So, I mean, can a horse actually slough its hoof capsule from an abscess? It could, yes. I'm like, especially in laminitis cases, because um, when they've got the laminitis cases and you've got the inflammation in the hoof already, and then you have infection because of stuff that's going on with the inflammation. Um, I've seen too, uh, like most of the time, I'm like, if, like if everything goes well, then um, they hold on to part of it while part of it's sloughing off. But I'm like, I've seen horses stuff almost their whole capsule over it. Okay. It's a, it's a long, it's a long ordeal. Yeah. 
But um, I think like she, this, I didn't put the after pictures up. I should have, she's getting along really well. She's um, last, I just trimmed her the last um, probably two weeks ago. And she's, she's sound on soft, on soft ground. She can't, the concrete, she's not lame on it, but she's careful. But she's how pretty long, How long, uh, how long ago did you start working on her? Let's see, I think uh, I'm gonna say the beginning of December. Okay. So and I was there a couple weeks ago. So I'm like she's healing. Like it's crazy how fast horses will heal when they're able to get total circulation and get to move their feet right. And the lady kind of changed her diet too, so she's not getting so much so much um, carbs. <laughs> right, but that so. hoof wall won't reattach. She just has to grow a new one. Yes, she's going to grow. Mike, she's and she's already doing it. So, Mike, uh, at some point, maybe I can send you the pictures and you can put an update with this so that you yeah. can see how well she's doing. No, this. I just, doing I, I, what I'm marveling is I never knew abscesses could get this bad. I guess is what I'm kind of like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, they can. They can get really bad, and so it's it's kind of funny because like some horses. Like when they have an abscess, you think that, that they broke their leg. I'm like, they're so lame. And then, then when it pops an abscess, I'm like, most of the time, everybody's like, it's just an abscess. But once in a while, I'm like, you'll get an abscess that you're thinking, holy cow, I'm like, that is a bad abscess. Did you put her in, in um, plastic shoes? Um, I did not put her in plastic shoes. I was, the, the plan was, the first, the first day we went to see her, the plan was to, to use a formal hoof mold and, and do that. But we didn't know she was abscessing. And so when we found out she's abscessing, then I didn't want to put anything because if, if I glued a shoe on her, like, mm -hmm. so see this infection here, if I glued a shoe on her, like that'd be cleaned up, but the, it would still be coming right around to that point right there. Right. And it would not have been, would not have been a good thing. I'm like, it was covering it up. Plus I'm like, all this is not very well attached. So we, we put her like the, for the first month she wore um, therapy boots. Okay. Yeah. Right. Somebody's asking but, um, when transitioning yeah. from shoes to barefoot, what's the length of time you recommend for glue on shoes? Um, so with, without fail, um, at least one round, four to six weeks, and we'll see how the horse is doing. And then sometimes we'll do a second round. But um, if everything is right and the horse is moving good, and it doesn't have any extenuating issues. I'm like, you'd be surprised in four to six weeks how well they start circulating, just to get, get the full expansion of their hoof back when they are loading and stuff. So but four to six weeks to start with. Okay, onward. Okay, and take this back out of here. So then, um, so then, so I'm gonna point out this, this is a heel bulb abscess. So, so sometimes, and mm -hmm. again, I'm like, yep, I keep forgetting that, sorry. It's okay. So, so this is a heel bulb abscess where the abscess actually comes out the heel bulb right here. Yep. And so some of these guys, like not all of them, but some of these guys, like they'll start, they'll kind of be lame. And then, then as they get like progressing through their symptoms, they'll get lame. And then oftentimes that their back of their leg will swell up, like um, up the back of their leg and the, then the tendon area. And so um, oftentimes that's related to this. And so, so once that they break out the heel bulb, the interesting thing is, though, because if I'm, somebody tells me that their horse is all of a sudden lame, um, if I'm not there, I'll have them kind of push on these areas with their their hoof pick to see if the horse reacts. And if they're going to if they're going to blow an abscess out their heel bulbs and you just kind of poke with your hoof pick there, they'll about come out of their skin like they're like that's super, super sensitive. And like sometimes you'll actually see before they blow the abscess, you'll see this get kind of red and purpley, too. It's just um, it's just like you can see it ready to come out. And the whole thing with the abscesses is that they, they follow the path of least resistance. So, so anytime you have this, this abscess, it's almost always going to be in relation with this bar. Like, so a heel bulb abscess usually in, incorporates this whole quarter here. And so oftentimes if they have a heel bulb abscess, they'll end up shedding off this bar and part of this heel buttress because the abscess goes in this, this quadrant. Okay. And so but if you kind of find a way out and it kind of migrates to the back of the heel. Yes. So oftentimes when they're, they're, that they're showing sensitivity here. Um, so like this bar, this bar and this horse is overgrown because it's just kind of the, the heels are kind of high too. But um, so if you, if you kind of come in here and just clean this up, sometimes you do one or two things. You're, you're removing some of the material that's holding in the infection. So it helps it to get, like out of one place or the other. So if you've got this kind of taken down just a little bit, I don't 
I don't dig for abscesses. Um, that's so I'm going to talk about that in a second too. But um, I'll kind of scrape off someplace and look for it. But I don't dig for abscesses. That's in my opinion, that's veterinarians like that's their field because I've seen people. I'm like, and different people dig for abscesses because they think that they know where they're at. So say, say for instance, this horse had an abscess, like it was showing sensitive right here, the testing with hoof testers and sensitive right here, but, and they dig right here. There's a chance that the abscess might actually be here because it's just, you can't really pinpoint the, the pain where it's exactly at. So when it comes to, to actually probing and digging for abscesses, that's, that's a veterinarian's uh, corner, not mine, because I don't wanna be the culprit of causing more abscesses or more infection. And veterinarians are, are like, I'll show you on an x-ray. They can use x-ray to see where the abscess is and that kind of stuff. So, but I will take the top off of a bar or something like that to see if there's any, like if sometimes if uh, it can be just as low as right here, if uh, there's a pocket of infection there and you take that part off and like the horse, it's crazy. And like the second you do that and set his foot down, they'll just like the sigh and like, and sometimes the infection will run out, but they just really will relax. And so like side subject, but on the subject, because, you know, you're the surefoot person, but so times like that. So like a, say, say this horse, he's showing pain and he hasn't broken out here. And I'm like, I just scuff this off just a little bit here. So that opens any, any place up for it to, to be able to drain. I'm like, we've had like pad where we've set them on surefoot pads and it lets them sink into the pad. If you think about the mechanism of that, um, when they sink into the pad, they actually, that actually helps the blood flow and it helps everything kind of like surround the foot. So horses that step on the pad like that, that you're trying to get the abscess to come out, the sure foot pad's always a plus. Like it's always, a, uh, it, it's a, like it would encourage it to come out if it was uh, just under the surface, in my opinion. Cool. So does anybody have any questions about that? I'm talking fast. Nobody has popped one in the Q and A or the chat. Okay. So, so basically, I think what you're saying there is if you see that you have an abscess at the back of the foot, you'll do a, a regular trim and maybe just take it, take the bars down just a little to see if there's something there. But digging is the purview of a vet. Because like you said, you know, if you open up a bigger space and let more infection, you've only made it worse unless you know what you're really yeah. 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 And I've seen that happen just too many times. And so like, it just, it doesn't make any sense. I'm like, like, our job are to take care of the feet, but the veterinarians know their job like to look for the infection. So I don't, I don't cross over that line. Right. But um, let me bring this up here. I'll make it bigger. So this is an, uh, this is uh, from equine podiatry, but this is like on an x-ray. So like some of the times, and this has happened probably a half a dozen times in my career where um, we treated the abscess I'm like, I'm like, and even like, even the veterinarians on board, I'm like, and we're doing all this stuff. I'm like, they, they hoof test it couldn't find it, couldn't find it. Um, and then um, they've, they've soaked it and they've did all the things that they could do. And so then at that point, like usually I'm like, I'm really encouraging my clients to get an x-ray because some of the time the x-ray is, is higher than anybody could reach. And it's just stuck. It's stuck in the, it's stuck in the wall up like midline of the foot. So they can, when, if you take an x-ray that you can see this one's a pocket here. You yeah. can actually see where it's starting to eat on the coffin bone. Yeah. So, so the problem is, is, um, is I, so I don't dig them, but, um, but, and, and sometimes they're prematurely dug by other people, but my thing with the abscesses are like for me, and like, and I always tell people to talk to their vet and see what their vet's ideas are. But, um, I have people, I'll have people poultice and, um, or soak. And if you don't start to see some, some relief, like within, I'd say a week, like after you're doing that, like they should already have had their vet, like at least aware of what's going on. But if you don't see some relief in a week or so, then if you have an abscess that's encapsulated in the wall and it's not able to drain for whatever reason, it can't go up or can't go down, that infection's laying against the bone. And so, um, and uh, I have I have dissected feet in here in the classroom that have um, where the abscesses, when we've dissected them, there was a pocket of abscess there and it's ate a, a pretty good chunk out of the bone. So their abscesses can be anywhere from just a, a blip in the road, but they can get serious and, and they can't be underestimated for what, what damage they could do. So I don't like to leave anything linger for, for over a week. Like I, I like, you know, I, I would say that they should have um, the veterinarian on board anyway, just so that they know what's going on. But uh, um, 
if it's there, I'm like, I have them start like, like asking the, the one horse, the one particular horse, it was a, it was a gated horse. And I'm like, and he's kind of a baby. So the owner, like the owner was giving him some time, you know, some horses can walk around with a huge abscess and not hardly limp. And some of them, like we have a horse, like we have a quarter horse. And like, if he has a tiny abscess, he lays out and groans. So, you know, he's, he's not the, he's not the toughest of boys, but um, this guy. Possible to like, have he a on, abscess like this and the horse actually be sound? Um, I have not seen one have an abscess this bad and be sound. Okay. They can, they can, they can be not, it depends on the horse. They can be like some horses I've seen horses have it this bad and just have a, a, a limp, but not like, like dragging their leg or something. But um, most of the time, if they're this bad, I'm like, they've got some pretty, pretty significant uh, pain. And, and also abscesses like this, I'm like, you'll, they're more than likely to have digital pulses, just like they would if they had laminitis, because um, this abscess is encapsulated in this hoof, hoof capsule, like, and it's putting pressure on the bone. And so there's, there's going to be a lack of perfusion with the blood vessels that are being affected. So you have a pretty decent digital pulse on a horse like this. Okay. But, um, so the horse that, that I had that had one, like very similar to this, um, the veterinarian came out and like, and he, he, he probed to try to see what he could come up with. And, and like, it was too deep. And so he, just like myself, was hoping that, you know, with soaking and, and poulticing, it would get, get closer to the surface. And after a week, I'm like, the horse is starting to like lay down and shake and sweat and stuff. So, so I talked to the owner and I'm like begging the vet to come back out. And um, he came out and I'm like, can he actually use a, what's an abscess probe? And he actually probed up the wall and it was halfway up the wall. So there was no way, um, uh, no one besides a veterinarian should ever do something like that because I'm like you had to get go through live tissue like sensitive tissue to get to where the infection was and as soon as he hit it I'm like it erupted I'm like and the horse had it, it was like turned out good but I'm afraid that if he wouldn't have did that at the time he did it I'm like it would have ate a pretty good chunk out of his coffin bone yeah so so um, be pretty serious yeah I'm like they can be anywhere from you know, you just some sometimes like this, these coronary ab, abscesses, like this one. These guys sometimes, I'm like that horse won't even tell you that anything's wrong. Like, the, like it just goes on like nothing's happened. And so the way I describe to people about abscesses, abscesses can act like a pimple or a boil. Like the pimple ones, you know, like it's it's for fish, it's like small. Doesn't really know that it's got anything. It's just like maybe it had like maybe you might see it like take an off step or something. And then, you know, they, they, they pop them and everything is good. But then some of them, like they're encapsulated. I'm like, the more encapsulated they are and the deeper they are in the tissue, the, like the worse the horse is, and it's much like a boil then. So you have to get it, you have to try to get it to, to come to a head or something to try to get it to feel better. I've got somebody complaining here. Let me see if she, nope, she's not going to let me pick her up. She just wants me to go upstairs and feed her greenies because it's that time of night. So she's going to be here yelling. <laughs> Tell your kids not to be mad at me. It's like it's like like morning somewhere. <laughs> no, bedtime we go up and we get greenies, which is her favorite thing. So it's that time of night and she's going to just sit here and yell at me. Yeah, so she's going to be going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. So um, so then uh, some of the other stuff I have on here. Let's see. So um. The other causes of my bruising is a big deal right now because again, because we were like, we're muddy, like, like two weeks ago, we were muddy and then we're in a vortex before the vortex. So the feet are all waterlogged and then um, I'll make that bigger. The feet are all waterlogged and, and just mushy. And then it, it freezes at night to where it's like, you've got all these ruts that are frozen and then it bruises them. And so uh, the bruises oftentimes can just turn into abscesses too. Um, and then the wet weather and dirty stalls, horses, horses that are in dirty stalls and are, that don't get to move a lot, they're, they're at higher risk for it too, because their hoof is soft. And then the bacteria is already in the stall. They're not getting to move. Right. Like for me, it's like when, um, when any of our horses abscess, uh, I like them to, to move as much as possible because horses are smart. Like if they don't feel like moving, they won't. If they feel like that they, you know, they're gonna hurt something, they won't. But I'm like, if they if they can walk a little bit, it adds circulation and it's more likely to help it drain faster. Um, the other thing is, and this is this is always a pickle, and like, and again, um, 
I'm like, I'm not just keep saying this about the veterinarians and stuff, but I don't want it to be mistaken that I'm telling anybody what to do. But um, one thing that is uh, always the controversy is, uh, that was Ada's phone. She forgot to turn it down. <laughs> Bye, Ada. <laughs> um, but so if an abscess, so if a horse is uh, getting an abscess and they're, they're still walking around fine, they're just walking carefully. Um, myself personally, I'm like, I don't like to give them an anti-inflammatory because it, it slows it down. But if, um, if they're like so painful that they don't want to walk, then I, then I want to give them something for their pain so they walk and help it circulate out. And so different veterinarians have different opinions on that. So again, like I tell people to talk to their vet about it, but the anti-inflammatories do play a part on how fast a horse can get rid of, you need inflammation to get rid of infection. And right. so it's a, it's a fine line. Well, what the body's doing, right? It's creating an infection to, to pustiness and everything and the white blood cells and everybody are going there to try and kick this thing out. And it's yeah. gotta go along a track to get out. And if we interrupt that process, Mm -hmm. that makes sense it's like you know if i get a splinter on my finger i want my body to start driving it out because it hurts and i can't get it with the tweezers <laughs> yep. yep it's exactly the same thing with the horses too so so uh it's always good to check to see what your vet thinks but like our horses i'm like uh, my rule with our horses are it's like if you feel good enough to walk i'm like oh, you're just gonna have to tough it out a little bit you're tougher than that and like that way, I'm like the body can do its thing. And I'm like, and they're not like, they're not off their feet. They're not laying down, but if they're having a hard time and they can't, they can't move or can't walk, then I'm like, I'm going to sympathize with them. I don't, I, I think they have the same rules for me. So it's like, if they can't, if they can't feel good enough to function, then they need to have something to help them function so that they can circulate and get rid of it. Right. But, and like, and that's across the board, Um, all the different, I'm like, like lots of vets have different right so i think the bottom line there is it's really important to check with your vet if you think your horse is getting an abscess have a conversation and find out what their sort of protocol is in terms of pain level versus movement um yes but you know like if you mask the pain you don't really get to see what the level of discomfort is or what's going on with that abscess right because if you like I can, I can think back to Al and, you know, he was uncomfortable, but still moving. And then as he became less moving, it was obvious this thing was coming to a head and by soaking, you know, we could accelerate the process. And of course I use homeopathics as well to kind of help things along. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we can do lots of things to help them. It's just um, being aware, like, like knowing your horse, first of all, and, being aware of what their normal is and then then helping them help help get rid of it. I know that sounds crazy, but like sometimes you just have to help them get rid of it. Right. By helping them. And, and every horse is such a different pain level. Like I had the one that, you know, he had a hangnail and he'd throw himself on the ground and the other one's like, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We've got that here. It's like, like I swore like um, our quarter horse Pecos is when he, when he gets an abscess. And so that I'm going to go back to another part because that's relative to him, but it's relative to other horses too. So I'm going to go back to this one picture right here because it has the picture of the bars. But, um, so with Pecos, so this is, this is something like it just popped into my head as I'm talking about him. On Pecos's right rear, like he has a, he has a little bit of arthritis in his stifle. So he has a little bit of a stifle issue, which causes him to have a different wear pattern on his right rear foot. So when he wears his right rear foot, the medial inside part of his foot like wants to like load first and then his outer part, his lateral side will like, like go outwards. And so um, in other webinars, we had talked, you know, the bars, the bars, these bars and the, the hoof wall, it's all related. So whatever one's doing, the, 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 whatever the bar's doing, the hoof wall will do and vice versa. So in Pecos's case, his lateral side, I'm like, it, it, that flares out because he wears really hard medially. So if I don't keep him trimmed, his foot will get like a windswept look. And mm -hmm. so I'm like, you have to keep him trimmed correctly and balanced. Again, it goes back a little bit to the flaring, but his isn't exactly flaring, his is overpressured. So if he, so like, we'll use this horse for an example. Say this is the medial side. So I'm like, he's worn this down and this is like swooping out. Well, if this swoops out, the bar will swoop out also. And so, like you have to remember this and I've never been a bar freak about trimming, but you have to keep your bars trimmed just like you would your hoof wall. You have to be like in unison with it. 
And so if this, if this flares out, this bar will fold over and the bar material is harder than the soul material. So if your bar folds over onto your soul, I'm like, that's a really good way to get a bar abscess. And I've done that before to Paco. So I'm like, I didn't like, I didn't trim him timely enough. And he, his wear pattern will cause his foot to do that. The bar will fold over. Then this bar is bruising underneath there and then he'll abscess. And oh, so, wow. and that, that can happen with wear patterns or bar foldings or that kind of thing, because like the bar, the bar is like having your toenail fold underneath your big toe and like, and pushing in the bottom of your foot, like it creates right. a bruise, a sensitive area. So I have to keep Pecos trim frequently and I have to make sure his bars stay strong so that they don't fold over on his, on his uh, sole. But um, so with that- It's a little off topic, but now that you've brought up bars folding over, um, you know, I can remember, now I've been trimming Al for a long time and several years ago, I remember that his bars were really long and folded over and I don't have that problem anymore. I mean, I just, I, I, I've changed so many things thanks mm -hmm. to all these webinars and your help, but what, what sort of precipitates that kind of growth other than like with Pecos and, and his wear pattern? So like, like this, like this is one of my favorite things. Of, like I love all the, all the things about the foot, but so one of the most, most misunderstood things of the foot and like the most controversial trimming thing across the board is about the bars. And I'm like, the bottom line is, is the bars are just hoof wall. Like, the, like, so they're all connected. This is all connected back to here. So whatever, no matter what the hoof wall does, the bar is going to do or vice versa. So if the horse, like, and not even to the extreme of Pecos, because every horse has their own wear pattern. So like, if the horse has a wear pattern that causes him to load one side harder than the other, more than likely the worn side is going to be straighter because it's more wearing off and getting more weight load on it. And the other side it will flare outwards or, or like go outwards because it's not wearing off. So then the length has got to go somewhere if it's not getting worn off. So usually it goes outward. If it goes outward, the bar will go outward. So like, there's like, I've not ever seen it. Oh, my internet said it just unstable. So I don't no, know. You're okay. You're good. <laughs> okay. So, um, so no matter, no, I've never seen it not, not coordinate. It's always like, no matter what happens. So like, if you see a horse, that's a hard medial loader, um, the medial bar will be straighter and the lateral bar will be more, more apt to go outward. And so, so one of the big things that changes things with a horse like Al is not just the trimming, but it's his wear patterns. So like, if you like horses that, that are in a, in rehabilitation for anything, but you're changing their wear patterns and you're actually causing them to land more balanced and correct on their, their feet, like that will change the way that their bar is because then their wear patterns will be different. So, so they won't like, if, if they flare out this way, if their hoof wall goes that way, their bar is going to go that way too. Okay. And keeping everything. So if you, if you take care of the flare on the hoof wall, then you have to take care of the flare on the bar or vice versa. So if you, if you're, say your hoof wall wears out like this and you let the, and you, you get rid of that and you tidy it all up, but you let the bar still have that, that swoop to it, your hoof wall is going to go right back out and vice versa. If you, if you get the bar straight, nice and straight and don't take care of this, I'm like, it'll still pull the bar out. And okay. so I'm like, that's a big thing with bar abscesses too, because I'm like, the bars need to be straight and strong. And I'm not, an, I'm not a person that believes in over trimming the bars. I'm like, the bars need to be addressed just like the hoof wall. And so it's, it's crazy cool like that really. Wow. Interesting. So now I, every time I have one of these uh, webinars on feet, then I go back to my horse's feet. I look at them again. <laughs> <the> only way. <laughs> I, I know I'm like, I like every time I have one, I'm like, I go look at more horses, <laughs> but, but um, they're fascinating. No, it's, you know, it's, there's so much to be, uh, to be gleaned there. Um, when we just understand what we're looking at. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And I'm like, I'm like, and it's so, it's so complicatedly simple. <laughs> yes. Yes. Like, it's, 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 <laughs> there's yeah. It's simple, but it's, not easy. I think it's the, yeah. the other way. Yeah. There's it. just so much, there's so much to it. I'm like, like when you look at all the structure in the foot and everything that's in here, I'm like every little thing, I'm like the, and the things I'm like the, the, the hoof is smart and the responses that it does. I'm like, there's so many things, but it's relatively simple because the horse just does what it needs to do to, to help itself. Right. And so it's, it's, it's like, uh, so when I'm teaching horse owners, you know, they, they think that they could never do it, but, but then after they do, they're like, they, like, they never look back because it's, 
like they know their horse better than anybody. So I'm like, they can go out and see something that like, and it could be minute, but they know it because it's their horse. And it's just, yep. it's kind of cool like that. Okay. So now I'm gonna go back to the treatments. So oh, okay. like we can do while we're doing that again, I'm like always consult with your vet. My favorite thing to treat at my favorite thing to help horses with um, abscesses by far is the Epsom salt poultice. And it doesn't have to be a specific brand. I just put this picture up there. So you had an idea like what I'm talking about with the Epsom salt poultice, but it's, um, it's green. It usually smells like winter green. It's got methyl salicylate in it. And so what, how I like to do it is um, I usually like pack the collateral grooves with the poultice, or if I'm suspecting that it's on the heel bulbs, I'm like, I'll, I'll take the gel all the way out to the, the heel bulbs. And then I'll put like a, a piece of gauze over it and some vet wrap. And then I'll put it in a therapy boot. And then what happens is, is the heat that they're producing in their foot in the boot and it kind of contains it. So it kind of is like the heat helps draw out the stuff with the, with the, um, the poultice. So like the Epsom salts is just a really good osmotic. And so it's my favorite, favorite thing to do. I used to like, I used to carry soaking boots for people and that kind of stuff. And soaking is just takes forever. And it's like, to me, the Epsom salt poultice is like soaking times 10. It's like wow. you get the benefits of soaking, but like multiplied. So, um, it's old school bucket of Epsom salts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it in the bucket. <laughs> yeah. Like it works, but it's I'm like, it's so slow and like the poultice and another thing I'm like for some of the horses, especially in this, like the soft, hard, yeah. um, the poultice, like if you just suspect that your horse has got a bruise on it, um, you can put the poultice on that. And sometimes that will draw the bruises out before it does anything that like amounts to anything. So this is probably too much information, but like this poultice, you know, I've gotten a splinter on the bottom of my foot before. I'm like, I can't see the bottom of my foot to pick out a splinter. So, <laughs> so I put a poultice on, I'm just saying, so I'll put the poultice on a Band-Aid and then I'll put it on the bottom of my foot and it pulls the splinter out because I can't see the bottom of my foot. No, like it's impossible. I get it. I think that's a great idea. It works. Yeah, like it works. So it makes it, it makes it easier. I, I think somebody's got a question. Oh uh, yeah, you're right. Oops, wait, I just kind of uh, lost my screen there. Uh, how long do you leave the poultice on for? Good question. So when, when I suggest to, to, to change it once a day, I'm like, and I would like to see a difference in about three days. So I'm like, I would say three to five days, but once you're getting past the three days, like you need to start making your vet just in case they're gonna have to come and do something else. But I like to change it once a day so you can kind of see where everything is at. See, cause some of the times I'm like, they'll have just like, they'll have a little breakthrough with the with the poultice and you won't even really know it because it's so tiny and then like and then even even after it's broke i usually keep them poultice for a couple more days too because depending on where the the drainage is coming from if it's in a place that's going to be hard for the horse to to keep draining then i like to keep the poultice on it so that it keeps pulling it out until we kind of get past the point and then so that goes into the next subject is so a horse that has let me go out of here for just a second i'm going to go to amelia's so a horse that has like this kind of thing going here and notice how amelia rolled this part up right here and you can kind of see the dark dark stuff right here yeah. she rolled that up just to keep the pressure or more good from getting up in there but when when you have something like that um I usually, I'll recommend to the client that once a month that they just put the poultice on for a day and it just keeps that moving so that it doesn't stock up in there somewhere. Because if it, if it stops like goat coming out, I'm like, then it's going to re refester and it'll come back out the top again. So it's so, kind of insurance. Yeah. Like it's easier, it's easier to just do that once a month than to have that refester up and have to start all over again. Right. Cause it is kind of still an opening when you have that it is. growing out. It is. I'm like, it's, it's an opening. So like, so the way I look at it from here, from here to here is tight because that's grown in and it's not, not infected anymore, but from here to here is loose. Got it. So, so when you get anything that would happen to, to peak in here, it can easily get back up in here and then just start refestering again. Yep. So I've had, I've done any horses that, that grow out like that. I usually, like I suggest to the owner to do that. And most of them do, and most of them prevent it from happening again. But you'll see a lot of those horses like reabscess in the same, like in the same track. Mm. 
And then that brings me to another subject. Like, so like every time I'm like, I think I'm, I can shut up for a second and I've got more. So, <laughs> so, so if you have a horse though, that has, that has um, uh, where the, this keeps happening. So like you'd say you get a, a month along and then it comes out here again and again and again. I'm like, and it just keeps doing that. Like that is most definitely sometime that you need to get um, with your veterinarian and see about x-rays and sometimes that you can't see something on an x-ray, like um, it won't show up on an x-ray. And so if, if your horse has that chronically over and over and over again, um, and it doesn't, doesn't subside, um, I would suggest about an MRI because um, I've known, so I'll go to two, two cases. One was the horse, and this is an unfortunate. So it was just last year's, um, one of the, my uh, classes for professionals, we were dissecting a hoof and that hoof, that hoof, let me get out of here for a second. That hoof had a, um, it had a, a heel bulb abscess that we did. It had a heel bulb abscess here. And then, um, so like after we got done trimming the hoof, then the student was dissecting it. And so she noticed that there was a pocket under here. And we also noticed that there were several abscess lines that was like, like in the, the um, bar and in this, this quadrant. And so she kept peeling through the different layers and like in the hoofs, those cadaver feet happened to come from Texas. So um, we got to where she was getting down deep and she got past the frog, she dissected off the frog and she was in the frog corium and down in the corium where it would have been impossible to see on anything but an MRI was a mesquite thorn. <gasps> it was down in the corium. And like, and like, when like we took, I, and I didn't put those pictures up here, but like it just popped into my head when we was talking about this, but there was a mesquite cor uh, thorn in the corium. And that's probably why that horse was euthanized because they couldn't figure out what, like they couldn't figure out what was still making him lame because like by all appearances, the frog and everything up here was fine. It was just the infection here. And I'm like in the repeated, like the repeated abscesses that kept happening. But I'm like, it was like, it was probably about a quarter of an inch mesquite thorn broke off in the aquarium wow so <laughs> cool. so um Not so cool, but cool. yeah it was, it, it was cool it was a cool finding but it, it's, it's a, a reminder that if something keeps happening and like and it's in the same spot over and over and over again um some of the things you can see on an x-ray you can see at least a shadow but some of the things you can't. And so like that one, you probably would have had to see it in an MRI because it's not going to show up in the frog quarry. I'm like, it, it was a thorn. Right. Wow. So uh, I just popped it in my head. I'm really getting yelled at over here. <laughs> uh, your cat's like, like the cat's going, do you know what time it is? Exactly. So, exactly. She's like, hey, tapping, so her, think, tapping her paw here. And uh, yes. And yes, Brad, you're gonna be in Brad trouble, I don't know where so. Brad is to call her. So. <laughs> Well, I think that's everything I have on my PowerPoint, like, unless you can think of anything else, because I like I was like things pop into my head. So, you know, so somebody's asking what what could they have done for the thorn? Could they they would have had to do surgery to remove it, wouldn't they? Yeah, they would have had to surgically remove it. Yeah. One of the times that we were in a conference at uh, when uh, Dr. Taylor was still at Auburn, I'm like, she had a similar situation where um, a thorn had broke off in the coronary band and traveled down just a little bit. And that horse was reabscessing, reabscessing, uh, constantly reabscessing. I'm like, and she actually, I'm like, she, like, I don't know how she cited it, if it's through an x ray or something else, but I'm like, she was able to, to drill a hole in the front of the foot almost to exactly where the, the piece of wood was stuck and like, and pulled it out. Mike and that was um that healed up fine but um okay. so, I don't so here's my one question for you what do we do to prevent abscesses so um that's a long list but i would say these things for sure um so like when we're having the wet and dry season um one of my favorite tools to use i'm like hands down without without any doubt is hoof armor Hoof Armor has done a lot to help um, the hooves getting so saturated. Like for us in the Midwest, um, we spend probably two to three months going in into fall slash winter and into spring slash summer of being in the gook. And the Hoof Armor works so good at like just helping the um, the hoof to stay a little bit um, more impermeable. And like, and I have my 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 people like actually put it on their frogs because the frogs get waterlogged here, and so the Hoof Armor really does a, a good job at, at toughing them up. And, um, and, and it's an easy thing for owners to do. And if the owners do it themselves, I'm like, you can do it like 
like we, we do it like around here about once a week when it's so sloppy out. So that's one big thing. So that helps with the, the soppy, like gushy hoofs. And, um, and then uh, diet, I'm like, diet's always a big thing because the more overloaded sugar diets have, I'm like, the more prone to abscesses you're going to be because your lamina is going to be weaker. And so, so always keep diets. I'm like, and then again, like, so Dr. Kellen has got some really cool research about the iron and stuff. And so it's not just the iron, but like, I think, you know, about like the heavy metals and stuff. So like to keep an eye on, on that stuff because they're, they're heavy metals that will, that, that starts to, um, it causes a lot of issues with the, with the foot because the foot is a vascular uh, organ and anything that's going to affect the rest of the body, it's going to really show up in the foot. So um, diet's huge, minerals are huge um, and that kind of thing. Like Dr. Kellen has some really good information on that. I think um, Joyce has a lot of that stuff too, doesn't she? Where, uh, you can... Yeah, and we, you know, it, it keeps coming back to these same things whenever we have a, have a discussion about feet, okay? in that if you don't have the diet under control, you're not gonna have the feet under control. And that just, I can attest to that because the, the number of changes I've made with Al and what his feet look like when I had the, the two springs with abscesses and what his feet look like this year. And I'm, one of these days I've got to do a webinar and talk about all the things I've done. Uh, using awesome. information from webinars to uh, resolve, I, and I think he's, knock on wood. I think he's okay now. We're going to get those x-rays and see what his feet look like on thir tomorrow. Uh, no, Thursday. But, um, you know, I've made changes in diet and changes in movement. Um, I put up pigtails and now the horses have to go all the way down and across a field and a half to get to the water and all the way back to get to the hay. And, and it was simple. I didn't make it overly complicated, but it, they just started moving. Um, instead of standing in their shed or standing at the hay and just walking 50 feet to the water and back to the hay. So, you know, those are things that the difference in the quality of his feet this year, I am not worried at all about abscesses compared to what his feet looked like a couple of years ago when I was having abscesses. So I, I really hear you there. I think that, um, that, that, that is just so critical to get under control. And he's, um, PPID, and we are working on that holistically um, and getting that under control because I think that's another huge factor it's huge. Uh, with these horses. Um, but the hoof armor is something else that keeps coming up over and over. And, and one of my concerns about hoof armor, but um, Alicia the other day talked about, apparently it is antibacterial. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's got some antimicrobial properties in it. Antimicrobial. Okay. Because that was the concern that I, I had was if I have some bacteria on that foot and then I trap it in there with the hoof armor, am I making the situation worse? So I don't believe that you'll be trapping it in there. I'm like, I'm like, you have to talk to David for sure about that. The, the maker, David and Brenda um, Jones, but I don't think you'll be trapping it in there because the hoof still breathes. But um, what it does is like, and, and I don't like, I, this part I'm just giving my point of view, but David would be able to explain it better. But it kind of warms up and I'm like, and it, and it dilates the pores of the foot just a little bit to where it's able to latch on. But I don't think it seals it up like 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 seals it. I just think it makes it more um, more resilient to um, being saturated. But I think it can still breathe. It's just um, I'm not so I will say it this far because I can't actually say everything that he knows about it. But um, I've used it on hundreds of horses and I haven't seen any any negative response whatsoever. I'm like, none. I'm like, to every degree. And so, like, I've just, I'm like, I've only seen positive results and, and not even questionable. I'm like, always, always to the good. So I'm pretty sure it does not, does not cut off any of the airflow. It just has antimicrobial properties as far as like, um, if like, so like if I've, I've used it on hoof cracks before. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like I still take the trim and do everything with the trim that we'd normally do, but um, I will squirt it in the hoof crack and it kind of helps the, that piece, those two pieces harden up a little bit, but the, whatever it has in it, and it's a proprietary blend, so I don't even know what it is, but whatever it has antimicrobially um, kind of helps that not become like an issue with like fungus and stuff. I'm like, and I'm like, and I've been, it's helped me grow out hoof cracks by using it like that. So I don't know all the ins and outs about it, but I, I know for sure that I have not had any, anything to the negative happen with it. Okay. No, that's all I needed to hear because, you know, that was the one concern. Um, and sometimes what I've done, and I don't know if this is good, bad, or otherwise, but I use tea tree oil 
and uh, oregano oil a lot of times if i see like there's something you know that i'm concerned about some bacteria or something like that and i think i've actually done oregano oil and then the farmer yeah i, I don't i'm like i don't i can't speak to like like for sure but i'm like i don't see where that would hurt anything yeah. one of the products that we we make for thrush is uh, the dry powder that we make i'm like it has oregano in it because like if you research oregano like like way far back it's got so many so many antibacterial and antiviral properties and like i think it works pretty good on fungus i don't have as much literature about the the antifungal properties with it but they used to um like when there wasn't antibiotics available in the 40s and stuff for humans i'm like they like a lot of people would take um oregano or oil of oregano yeah and it's just it does crazy cool stuff right and you just want to make sure it's medical grade or food grade that you're not taking anything other than food grade if you are taking it and we're not recommending that you do that but there are products available go research it <laughs> yes that's what i say too i'm like <laughs> we just just telling you some things we came up with don't they're not like <laughs> right but it, but on feet that's it's just a really handy uh you know i use a regular oil if it looks like something's a little gooey and then i have done the hoof armor on top which sounds like it's totally fine because um but it yeah those are awesome recommendations and you know that uh, oh, we got some questions here. So let me just see what we got. Uh, what's the best way to dry out hooves in this weather for applying hoof armor? So if um, if you're not afraid to do it, because I do it and it's not scary, but I'm like, it kind of sounds scary when you first tell people, but if you get like one of those little tiny micro torches, and I do this when I glue shoes on or hoof armor or, um, or form a hoof, whatever the case might be, um, you just take those little torches and kind of like, like go over it a couple times. And then you can put, you can actually put your foot, like if you're going to be in for a little bit, you can put your foot in a diaper for a little bit and it kind of sucks some of the moisture out. And then right before you put it on, torch it and then put the hoof armor on. Like, and that dries it out pretty good. Yep. And um, um, somebody's saying that David has talked about this and he says the hooves can breathe through hoof armor. So that's good to know. I was pretty um, sure. And then I have, I ride a horse in flex boots, even in our arena, because we have rocks. Uh, I had heel abscess that took a month to heal. And I'm pretty sure from hitting rock under saddle in the spring when the feet were soft, like you say. Uh, so there is, they're asking if that's a good idea to use hoof armor for that also. On the heel bulbs? Well, I think just on, on, on the feet, even though they're in flex boots to toughen them up because of the surface. Will it, will it help kind of make them a little yeah, bit? I'm with the rocks like it's kind of um yeah yeah because the flex not. boots oh my god the flex boots are awesome boots oh my god but they're very very so covering they are soft so I'm like if you hit a, a big enough rock oh my god the horse would still feel it a bit through the boot and so the hoof armor would definitely but help with that yeah it's a it's um it's a really interesting product and once once you get the hang of applying it it's not so hard <laughs> I remember the first time I had to line up all my little items and my torch and my gloves and the get the gun going. Of course, it was colder. So it was, you know, keep it warm, blah, blah, blah. But once you do it a couple of times, you get kind of the technique down and yeah, it gets easier. And so then so now my students and I might like, we see how many feet we can get out of one tip. Oh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Gotta keep it real, you know. <laughs> Great. So, OK, so diet exercise hoof armor um and um that's what that's what i did i guess i remember last summer i mean i basically stuck the horses in a stall overnight to dry out their feet because it was so wet and so they were out during the day and in at night um just because we had such wet conditions and while it's not ideal to put a horse in a stall it really solved a lot of my foot problems at that time yeah sometimes it, like so that's what, like, whenever I'm telling people what to do or giving them some suggestions, I'm like, I'm not an extremist to anything. So it's like, like, you know, sometimes we use our stalls the same kind of way because like we, we flood here. And then I'm like, if it's super soppy out, I'm like, I want them to come in and get dried out. It's like, I wouldn't want, the, it's just, it just, you know, kind of, I don't want to say common sense, but it makes a difference. I'm like one, one day in on a dry, dry dirt or sawdust or whatever that's in your barn, can really help dry out the hooves long enough that they can just kind of like start over the next day. Right, right. It's kind of like if you're standing in water for too long, your feet get all wrinkly. Mm -hmm. Yep, like yep. <laughs> you gotta dry them out. Um, so, and it really does depend on, uh, you know, again, your location, what it, what your environment is like. Um, 
I, I would assume that horses that are in a more dry environment are probably less prone to abscessing. I think that's probably a good assumption. Yeah, because the hoof gets harder in the drier conditions. Yep. Well, I didn't I hear your cat. Yelling at you. Go ahead. Go ahead. What were you going to say? I heard your cat yelling at you. Oh, yes. Yeah. So she's been yelling at me for half an hour now. <laughs> you know, I think she's saying, she's saying, she's saying, shut up. I'm going to wonder why do I keep looking down in this webinar? Because she's around my feet. But if I try to go and pet her, she scoots off because she wants me to go upstairs. And uh, well, she's telling me to shut up by now. She's like, maybe she's going to reach up in a minute and take the like her paw and just shut the computer off. <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody's asking if there's a video of the torching part. I can probably do one, but it's really, it's not that hard. Basically, the torches are like gigantic cigarette lighters. Uh, I think they're used for other things, but the, they're, they're about that big, about two inches tall. Um, you have a trigger on it. So basically, I know you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I pick up the foot. I, you know, if anybody's ever had shoes, hot shoes, you can remember the smell of burning sole, right? Burning wall. And it's kind of like that. I just kind of go around and watch the little fibers that are sticking up burn off and make sure I don't like yep. the hair on fire. <laughs> yep. Really important. And the nice thing about those little, like those type of little micro torches is the flame is only like maybe a quarter to a half an inch like long and it's very pinpointed so it doesn't go all over the place one of the biggest things you have to remember is just not leave it in one place very long keep it moving just kind of keep waving it over the bottom of the foot don't keep it in one place but the horses don't like they don't mind it until they start smelling some heavy duty burnage and then they worry yep um now it's it's pretty simple all right looks like there's one more question here uh a brand name for the torches just go to your local uh five and dot you know milk milk butter and egg store and they'll have them on the counter <laughs> they have them at gas stations they have them like they have them everywhere i'm like i came i used to have an official like i used to carry around a cream brulee torch which was dumb because you have to keep like like filling it up with butane and stuff but the one day i had it and like i needed it for gluing on shoes and I, it was out of butane and i didn't have any butane so i went to the gas station and they had them right on the, the counter and i'm like i bought a couple and like i like them better because they're they're cheap, they're easy, and have a smaller pinpointed flame. So yeah, they, end up being a good thing. And um, I, I hate to think of why they've become popular, but they're <laughs> great for what we do. <laughs> I, heard, I heard, like I was getting made fun of at one of my classes for one of the popular uses of those. I'm like, I didn't know, have any idea. I'm like, I call them hoof torches. I'm like, that's why I use them for hooves. Yeah. I'm like, I didn't know all that other <laughs> stuff that they use them for. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're digressing here now. I think it's time to wrap this up. So um, just unshare your screen and we'll we'll finish it up. Okay, let me see. Yep. Okay. So thanks so much for this talk. This is great. You know, it's a very appropriate topic coming into spring. Um, so this has been terrific. And of course, um, Diane Sepp tuned in late so you can watch this and all the other webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Um, what's today? Oh, Thursday, it's 9 a.m. So we're doing late night and then <laughs> 9 a.m. with Ma Martina Neardhart from Switzerland. Uh, she's going to talk about rehabbing DDFT, the back, and laminitis. So that'll be a really kind of appropriate week that we're doing this week of injuries and abscesses and, awesome. and healing. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, Ida. Great to see you. Same here. See you again in person one of these days. I know. Like, I'm, I'm hoping you're still coming to one of our APCs this year. Yeah, I'm hoping. I think I have them on my schedule. I have to check and see which one's going to work out. Awesome. Um, all right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Get a good night's sleep, and I'll take care of my cat now. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. -bye.